Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is Sandra and I make videos all about cybersecurity, having a career in technology as well as work vlogs. So today we're gonna have a video for expectations versus reality of software engineering versus cybersecurity. Okay, so these are gonna be random things that we kind of thought up of. All right, the first thing that came to my mind is right out of college, you are so excited for work. You can't wait to solve the biggest, best, hardest problem at work. But once you come to the office, you're like, all right, I'm ready. What what you got for me? And then the manager or the tech lead's like, oh, you know, we got some uh, nice CSS bugs. That's really challenging. We got to get them fixed as soon as possible. Let's get to it, you know? But although they might sound boring and stuff, they're still really hard because you still need to find where they're located in the code base. So it's kind of like you expecting to do all these big things, but then the reality is it takes steps. You have to do some of the bug fixes and actually get to know the code base before you can even move on to solve this uh, really hard problem. So that was a very interesting one. Oh, that's funny because I always found CSS to be very hard. <laughs> because like even just like adding some padding to something, you, you would have to like go through a lot of tedious yeah tedious yeah. Word. so for me i think one expectations versus reality that i had going into cybersecurity was that you kind of see all those you know videos and movies of what a hacker looks like and <laughs> it's like yeah it's always like some like teenager some really young person like that's a super tech pro and they're just like doing random things and then they're like bam they're like suddenly in the system but real life cybersecurity is nothing like that um it's definitely a lot more tame and i could be going into work and just sitting in and just waiting for a request to come into my mailbox for some kind of event mm -hmm. or it, it probably isn't usually a security breach because mm -hmm. you don't get those every single day um it's probably just some kind of like suspicious activity that someone reported and then you have to just follow steps to act on it or you're doing pen testing and you already have the number of security assessments scheduled for you and you know you already know what's coming up and it's not like you're hacking into someone's device or something you're really just testing on you know a non-production environment usually yeah it's definitely not as serious as movies make it sound but i mean i'm sure if you're like a red teamer for the nsa or like the cia maybe you know that is a bit more hacky up. yeah yeah since you're like working with nation states and stuff um but for the most part i I'm not working directly or I'm not directly defending against nation states. So I think that definitely was an eye opener when I got into the job and your everyday is just, you know, sitting in front of a screen and doing more normal job things and not just like hacking into people's devices. I guess another expectation is that if you follow the tech industry, you hear a lot of the buzzwords, big data, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all these kind of cool, popular fields right out of college or coming into software you might be thinking like oh can't wait to work on one of these projects mm. but the reality is a lot of the time if you're not applying to those roles or know ahead of time those are the ones that you want to settle with you will be matched with like a product team that's not necessarily using any of those machine learning artificial intelligence or data science tool sure it might be a little bit but the reality is most likely you're just going to be using normal objective oriented programming language, build some applications, back end, front end, not much machine learning. So unfortunately that's the reality for majority of the software that's still fun though. Okay, so my next thing is actually having to do with code. So I didn't really expect cybersecurity to have any coding because I didn't really have that much knowledge about what cybersecurity roles out there were when I was applying to jobs. But my first role, I was more of a developer, so of course I was coding. Um, and my second role, since I was in a rotation program, um, I was actually doing pen testing. And while I didn't necessarily code all the time, I had mentors who were um, already like on the red team, and they wrote custom scripts basically to hack into different things. Um, if they found something interesting, they would try to play around with it. and write like a custom payload into it if they wanted to. So there definitely is coding in cybersecurity. Basically, I didn't think my coding skills would help me in my cybersecurity roles because I didn't think cybersecurity roles had much coding in them to begin with. So that was definitely a good learning surprise. And another thing is that there are a lot of roles in cybersecurity that kind of 
cater directly to having those coding skill sets. Um, for example, source code analysis. There's a lot of tools out there that you can use to basically scan code bases, uh, repos for different vulnerabilities. And then they need someone with a technical coding background to be able to look at those things or look at those findings and verify if they're real or not. And you have to know how to read code to be able to do that. So that's definitely a cool job if you're interested in like coding and cybersecurity, as well as like malware analysis, um, like reverse engineering, different uh, payloads and stuff. And they come in all sorts of different languages. So if you know Python, C, C++, and now Go is a, sorry, didn't mean Kotlin. to point at you. I, 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 <laughs> okay. I'm a Kotlin guy. Okay. okay, yeah, okay. Go is another popular language that people are writing malware in because a lot of malware detection programs don't detect payloads in Go yet. So not that you guys should be doing any, <laughs> not that you guys should be creating those, uh, malware, but you that, know, reverse people, engineering. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. I have a fun one. So I guess out of college, one of my expectations is can't wait for the grind, can't wait to go to, into the office five days a week, just working on my desk. But the reality hasn't been that for majority of the people as you guys know, we are in the middle of the pandemic. I actually witnessed firsthand as many of you have that a lot of tech companies are transitioning from the in-office work style into more of a hybrid or even fully remote work and that definitely is not what I expected and surpassed my expectation and uh, to be honest in college that's exactly what I wanted so but I wanted to have a realistic expectation because majority of the tech companies not doing these work from home and uh, I know I talked to some of my alumni like people have been in the industry and they talk about how like they work from home once a week you know like they try their best to communicate with their manager but now it become more of a norm and I'm actually sure. really happy about this reality so that's like a positive reality and uh, yeah that's something like I'm pretty happy about okay so for my next one I guess I'll say something also more related to like work culture yes yeah, so, like when I was in college I thought I was gonna have a lot of time after work you know just because in college you have like four or five classes at a time you have like student organizations you're dealing with like a bunch of other things just in general and a lot of homework and studying and exams but at work you know it's usually like a nine to five well actually it's more like a nine to six or an eight to five yeah you basically are logged in for a set portion of time 40 hours a week and you don't expect to be tired <laughs> or like you don't you expect to have more time after work to do the things that you want to do or like you know personal things um hobbies and stuff but that isn't necessarily the case from what I've seen, um, especially like talking to friends and having worked for two years now, I, I don't always feel the motivation after work. Even if I didn't have the busiest work day, I'll still feel drained, but it's just because your brain is always on. Your and, brain is working too yeah, hard. Like waiting for like something to pop up, someone to ping you, someone's email. And you're like always like Alerted. active. Yeah, yeah, you're always you're alert. Always, yeah, working, yeah. Yeah, and that's what makes you very tired at the end of the day, so one expectation versus reality is that i thought i was gonna have so much time to do the things i want to do from like five o'clock to ten o'clock or whenever you sleep and as well as your weekends because you're not studying but on weekends people end up using a lot of it just to relax and unwind because you're so drained from working but it definitely depends on the role i would say um and the person but i noticed that when i'm working and spending a lot of time with friends and like socializing because i'm more of an introvert that gets me double drained and yeah. then I feel extra unmotivated to do things. Yeah. yeah, I mean definitely like make sure you're aware of all these things like try to make sure to exercise and uh, just mm -hmm. enjoy life as it goes because living in the present I would say trying to make the best of your time. And, uh, yeah. yeah, like taking care of yourself Yeah, for sure. is definitely always number one. Especially pandemic like working from home if you are and uh, it's, it's harder to separate work from actual life. So that, that makes it even more challenging. All right, next up, let me think. Okay, all right. I guess another expectation is kind of like the programming languages, for example. Like, I thought it would be fair game to use whatever language you prefer. Sure, like the team might be working on something, but you can always communicate between the languages. But that's, that's a very childish assumption. And uh, a lot of times, you don't fully understand a programming language and its pro and con until you join the workforce. So something I learned is like most 
infrastructure or like back-end code nowadays, especially in more developed countries, not countries, more developed uh, company is <laughs> built using C++ or Java. And uh, in college, I didn't really like those two languages, but now I come to appreciate of them. And uh, for example, Python is less structured and less type safe. For example, it's not very often used on my company and it's mostly used just for scripting purposes and even machine learning for example like you talk about how python has a lot of libraries like yeah it does but it's actually built on c a lot of it so like c plus plus and a lot of the machine learning teams they are developing machine learning model using c plus plus so it's like all these things that you don't really know before you join the workforce unless you did heavy research so i thought that's something very cool and uh, eye-opening yeah you used to love python I still do, yeah. <laughs> but I just don't use it. Yeah, I use Python for scripting too, but I think my company is a little different in that way because since it's not like a, since I'm not working at like a big tech company, they definitely see Python as more of a cooler language and they use it for a lot more things. Fun fact, Python is older than Java. But people act like Python is so new and so like sparkly. Mm -hmm. Java was the language that was created that was supposed to save us all, save all the program. But uh, it's slowly getting there. But you know, Kotlin. Okay, so another expectation that I had, um, just based on my prior experience working in like a software engineering internship, it wasn't necessarily cybersecurity. So that was probably why. But I had the thought that you know we would be working in teams. There's like daily stand up and stuff like that. But th that's not necessarily the case in cybersecurity, especially since you, most of the work you tend to do alone. So before I started working, I always thought that, okay, I would be working in a team. If I had questions, I could ask someone. Um, but oftentimes when you join a project or when you join a team, you're usually working solo to accomplish whatever things that you're doing. And if you ask questions, yeah, you can probably ask questions to your manager or your teammates, but oftentimes there could be a project that only you are spearheading. So you can't really ask anyone on your team, but rather you have to look for people in your company that might know something about the topic that you're working on. And then they're the ones who will help you. Um, like 90% of the time when I'm working on different projects or new initiatives for my manager, they're not the one that are gonna give me the answer to anything because yeah. they know less than I do for most of the things that I'm trying to work on. So instead it's me trying to reach out to other people in my company basically cold emailing them or cold reaching out to them um, and being like, hey, I, I saw that your name was on this one article that I read um, internally and this is what I'm working on. Do you think I could pick your brain a little bit on this? Most of the time they're willing to help you because you know um, they usually own some kind of process or own some kind of own some kind of knowledge base that is revolved around that and it's their job. Yeah, so that's usually how I get my information and I'm usually working alone and if I am reaching out to people, it's not my manager or my immediate team. It's other people from random places in the company that just happen to have the information that I need to do my job. All right, how about for the last one, I say what I expect from you and then you tell me if it's true, the reality, and then oh, you okay, ask me. Okay. All right, for this last question, like we're gonna spice things up. So my question <laughs> for you is, I expect cybersecurity people to be working 24 hour, like, Maybe as a team, like you guys are always passing around each other, like what you have done, and then you're trying to have a 24 hour on time, and then you're always alert and trying to observe something, for example, graphs or something, like to see if anything seems suspicious. I know you already said a bunch about like other stuff, mm. but. So. It <laughs> <laughs> you can. Okay, so it depends. From my experience, I've never worked on a 24, it's like a 24-7, 365 follow the sun model. So you basically like have a team in the US and then in Europe and then in Asia, and then those eight hour work segments um, match directly and you're basically able to work 24-7 all the time. So the teams that I've worked on haven't done that. Um, for example, pen testing teams, usually since we have scheduled security assessments you don't necessarily have to have if like if we were the blue team and we're more defensive they definitely have a follow the sun model because they there always needs to be someone manning the perimeter and making sure that they're monitoring like you know like you were saying those metrics and mm -hmm. any graphs or whatever metrics that they're looking at um, as well as keeping up with news from like different nation states or um, other hackers that are out there 
and yeah so basically for those teams there's usually some kind of handoff call at the end of the day so the team that is handing off to the next team there's like some touch base and they pass over any projects or ongoing ongoing emergencies to that team to handle so then the first team isn't working overtime just to handle certain things and everyone's basically in the same loop Nice. So yeah, it, it, it can depend on your team a lot. Okay, so one thing that I've heard a lot about in software engineering is burnout and how like people just code 24-7. You basically get burned out really fast. So what's that like? Yeah, I would say that's actually a pretty unfortunately it's a sad reality. And uh, in software engineer, even if you don't work 24 hours or like long hours, like you can still get burned out pretty easily just because you're always thinking, like always planning and coding require a lot of brain power and if you are constantly working like weeks after weeks, working on projects after projects, like you can get exhausted very, very easily, like it's true. And uh, mm -hmm. I experienced some of these things already and uh, it's not very fun, like your brain just gets so painful and uh, my recommendation for all of you out there is definitely take it easy, like the career is really long like sure like you want to grind as hard as possible get to a more senior level but it's not necessarily like the finance industry i'm, I'm sorry i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding uh, it's not, You're not an investment bank. yeah it's not like the higher you go the less work you do like it's actually the more senior that you become the more responsibility you have to take on and they expect you to do more and more and then you constantly have to perform above and beyond to maintain your same trajectory so it's like more and more stress building up and yeah, it, you definitely have to be ready for all that and uh, pace yourself and enjoy life. Go do something outside of work and when you're working, still take breaks because otherwise, like, you don't know when burnout will happen. Like, you might be thinking, like, oh, I'm young, like, burnout, not gonna happen to me. You never know. So it's better to be safe than sorry. That's my recommendation. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's the reality. Okay, so sorry to end on such a dark note, guys. <laughs> not dark. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's still a good video, about but work. yeah, yeah, on a Sunday morning and we're talking about burnout. So um, thank you guys so much for watching. Please let us know in the comments below if you have any expectations versus reality questions for us and we are happy to answer them. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much. If you liked it, please give a thumbs up and subscribe and turn on post notifications. I post videos or we post videos every Wednesday at 2 p.m. and Sundays at 12 p.m. And hopefully I'll see you guys in our next video. Bye.